Okay, so today we're going to talk about examples of famous portraits. So this is a slideshow lecture that will hopefully introduce you all to a really great working context of contemporary and historic photographers who have been making portraits in really compelling and fascinating ways. So there's some interesting stories you'll hear in this lecture, and hopefully it'll help you all gain a little bit of insight into a brief history of portraits. So let's go ahead and get started with the slideshow. So you can find these slides also posted on D2L for you to review on your own and take a look at further length with all of the lecture notes in those slides. But I thought it would be helpful to kind of walk through some of these examples to give you guys some inspiration for your famous portrait recreation project coming up. So I wanted to start with this image, which is by Steve Curry. It's called Afghan Girl, and the photograph was made in 1984. Uh, this photograph became the cover in June 1985 on National Geographic. And the photograph uh, by Steve Curry, Steve McCurry, who's a photojournalist, actually depicts uh, this really striking adolescent girl with green eyes and a red headscarf. She's looking really intensely at the camera. Uh, now, we don't know the identity of the photo's subject, or we didn't know that initially, but in early 2002, she was identified, and she was a Pashtun child living in one of the refugee camps in Pakistan during the Soviet occu occupation of Afghanistan. And what's interesting about this portrait is that it's actually been likened to uh, Leonardo da Vinci's painting of Mona Lisa, and it's been called, uh, quote, the first world's third world Mona Lisa. Um, and you can kind of see some of the similarities there with her hooded look, the really sort of undecipherable gaze. There's a lot of overlap there. Um, the image became emblematic of a refugee girl or a woman located in some distant camps deserving of the Western viewer's compassion. And it became a symbol of Afghanistan to the Western world. So it sort of shows, you know, obviously this photograph was depicted on the cover of National Geographic, but this photograph is not only a portrait, but it's really transformed into an icon. This is another very famous photo by FSA Farm Security Administration photographer Dorothea Lang. This was taken in 1936 of a woman out in uh, the, the Midwest farming area as she sort of hugs tightly to her children. They hug back at her. And of course, the FSA photographers got a lot of flack uh, because they were accused of staging the photos or making them up uh, in order to create this sense of awareness. But ultimately, you can't deny that this woman has uh, really intent gaze, wrinkles. It feels candid in so many ways. And so the goal with all of the FSA photos was to create awareness and to provide aid to these farm workers. This iconic photograph by Gordon Parks depicts a woman named Ella Watson, and it's called American Gothic, Washington, D.C., and it's from 1942. In 1942, Gordon Parks, a black photographer, he arrived in Washington, D.C. to work for the FSA as well. He was really excited to document the African-American community like he had done previously in Chicago, but he didn't quite realize the challenges that he'd have to face as a black man in D.C., which lay on the racial fault line between the nations North and South. And so um, FSA director Roy Stryker told Parks he should start by exploring Washington without his camera. And he found lots of bigotry. He was turned away by restaurants, kicked out of theaters. He was denied service at a respected department store where he had just simply attempted to buy a winter coat. And after just a few days, Parks was totally, completely demoralized. He declared, you know, racism is super rampant in a quote uh, that he was featured with. When he did return to the FSA headquarters, 
the director recommended that Parks begin his project closer to home. And so Parks approached a black char, uh, charwoman who was cleaning the FSA offices. Her name was Ella Watson. She told Gordon Parks that she'd become pregnant out of high school and that her husband had been shot to death two days before their second daughter was born. She was now working to support herself and her two grandchildren. And at the end of their conversation, Parks asked if he could take Watson's picture. And she agreed. And for four months, she actually gave him access to her home and to her community. And so what came out of that and out of this photograph was a sort of breakthrough in Parks' career. He gained a really intimate perspective on the reality of life for blacks beyond the historical, uh, the historical beautiful, like everything's okay, gleam of Washington, D.C. Uh, by depicting crumbling homes, trash filled neighborhoods. And uh, this photograph really is the culmination of that series of her standing with this broom in front of an American flag, a really interesting pose, and her gaze sort of falls slightly off from where the camera is positioned. This photograph some of you might be familiar with is Child with a Toy Hand Grenade in Central Park, which is a 1962 photograph by Deanne Arbus. And Arbus uh, is very well known for her images of individuals living on the fringe or living on the edge of normalized society. And interestingly, she always selects photographs that she's taken that show something odd, eccentric, or weird about people. And in this photograph, uh, she found this boy, she didn't know who he was, but found him in Central Park and um, asked him to uh, actually pose for this image. It shows this boy with the left strap of his shorts awkwardly hanging off his shoulder. He's tensely holding onto his long stringy thin arm by his side. Clench in his right hand is a toy replica hand grenade. His left hand is held in a claw-like gesture and the facial expression on him is maniacal, is how it's been described. And what's interesting is she asked him to just pose for the photo and the boy himself made the active choice to have this odd, creepy, strange facial expression, which becomes a really political statement, I think, especially when shown with his hand clutching this grenade. This portrait is of John Lennon and Yoko Ono, and it was photographed by Rolling or photographed by Annie Leibovitz for Rolling Stone magazine. Um, was published in 1980. And what's really interesting about this this photograph is that hours after Annie Leibovitz took this portrait, there was a uh, a woman who was sort of stalking John Lennon, she, uh, a former security guard. Uh, excuse me, not a woman. It was a male, a jealous former. There was a jealous former security guard named Mark David Chapman who fatally shot Lennon outside his building on New York's Upper West Side. And so when Rolling Stone published Leibovitz's photograph in 1981, Ono became um, this sort of iconic image. She was a widow and the world was mourning the death of a legendary rock star. And the picture ultimately documented the celebrities' couple's last hours together, and it's maybe a depiction of their very last kiss. In 2019, 2020, and beyond, uh, it still stands as one of history's greatest images of both love and loss. Joseph Karsh's portrait of Winston Churchill was taken in 1941, and this has quite an interesting story behind it because the photograph was actually taken of Churchill. You know, the war is um, like just about to wrap up uh, World War II. And Churchill had given a speech before the Canadian Parliament. After the speech, Church, um, was brought, Churchill was brought into the speaker's chamber where Karsh had already set up his camera and lighting equipment the night before. 
and uh, Churchill had not been told he would be photographed for this occasion. He relented, but at the same time, he decided to pull out a cigar, light it, and begin puffing away. The funny part of the story is that right before he tripped the shutter on this photo, uh, Karsh actually took the cigar out of Churchill's hand. And so you get this really sort of intense, deep grimace on Churchill's face. And there is another photograph out there of Churchill actually smiling, jovial, but this image is far more compelling and became the image of Churchill most associated with his leadership and role as a political leader during World War II. This photograph by Daoud Bey depicts Barack Obama, as you can see. It was taken in 2007, so right before Obama was elected and came into office. It was taken on a Sunday afternoon in Barack and Michelle's um, Hyde Park home in Chicago. And the portrait, I think you can describe it as both stately, but it's a little bit informal as well. Um, Obama's hands are folded gracefully in his lap. He wears an elegant suit, a white shirt, but isn't wearing a tie. He stares intensely into the camera. And actually, before this portrait, Obama had planned to just wear his button-down top, and at Dawood Bey's request, he put on the suit jacket, kind of tying up the look, um, which I think works extremely well. It's regal and yet informal, and the whole portrait centers around the gaze of his eyes, the lighting coming from perhaps a window uh, just to, to the left side of where we're viewing the portrait. This is Bob Seedman's photograph of Janis Joplin. Uh, obviously, Seedman photographed Joplin wearing absolutely nothing but beads. This image is from the 1960s when Seedman was becoming really well known for capturing images of members of the Grateful Dead uh, looking all dressed in black and in a row of uh, cookie cutter houses in uh, the suburbs in the Bay Area. And really his images of what rock and roll is, what rock and roll means, what that means for culture, um, is what defined the 1960s, uh, 1970s. This image by Mary Ellen, Ar <laughs> Mary Ellen Mark, the Dam family in their car, Los Angeles, California, is taken, uh, was taken in 1987. And um, Mary Ellen Mark was really well known for her work as a photojournalist, a street photographer, a portraiture, some advertising phot uh, photography. But she is quoted as wanting to photograph people who were away from mainstream society and towards its more interesting, often troubled fringes. This portrait by Roy, Tur Roy de Carava depicts John Coltrane, who is a legendary, very well-known jazz saxophone player. This portrait was taken in 1961, and sort of the dominant question <laughs> with portraits of musicians is how do you portray a musician playing their instrument? How do you portray the sound, the movement, the experience of improvisational jazz? Well, I think this image is a really great example of it and perhaps one of the reasons why it's considered a famous portrait of John Coltrane. Um, this image vibrates with the intensity that Coltrane brought to his music and the multiple exposures that were involved in taking this photo suggest the cascading notes that poured from the saxophone as he was playing. Um, what's interesting also is that the photo, and this is described in the article I've linked in the notes, um, the photo seems like a glimpse into the spirit world. The physicality of Coltrane, who was a really large, pretty bulky dude, it becomes really indistinct how large his body is um, because it's become far more diffuse, 
blown apart by the exploration of the ecstatic possibilities of his music as described in the article. This image by Nick Ut of um, Kim Fook, also known as Napalm Girl, was taken in 1972. And clearly this is during the Vietnam War. Um, and this photograph was taken of a South Vietnamese born Canadian woman um, who had been, uh, you know, who was screaming in pain as she ran away from the site of war. Uh, what I think is interesting about this image is that it's so, for me at least, clearly points to much of the journalistic imagery that we've seen come out of the Black Lives Matter protests, the militarized use of, um, of pepper sprays, the thought of a heat ray gun, all of that. Uh, this photo seems to have, of course, a really contained timelessness. And then Lee Friedlander, Lander's uh, nude portrait of Madonna was taken in 1981. And most people know Lee, Lee Friedlander for his images taken outside car windows of landscapes, cities, reflections. But in the 1980s and late 1970s, he actually worked on a series of portraits of nudes, both famous nudes and um, not famous people. And, um, you know, what's interesting is that I think these images don't necessarily objectify the female body, um, but rather sort of show it in a romanticized or erotic way. Like, there's so many of these portraits in this series, the Madonna photograph included, where the female seems really confident, content, with her body, with her pose, and is completely complicit in the creation of these images. It, it, it feels to me, and please feel free to disagree, that even though these photographs were taken by a male and the male gaze is implied, there's a sort of sense of ownership to these portraits on the part of the female. So we're going to look at a few images by August Sander um, to, to take a deeper dive into a few photographers here. Uh, August Sander was a German portrait and documentary photographer, very well known for his series People of the 20th Century. And he was born in 1876 and lived until 1964. So much of his imagery in uh, Germany depicts, oh, and this is him, by the way, uh, much of his imagery in Germany depicts the, the fashion, the style of the time, the uh, sort of industrial working class, the industrialization of the Western world, uh, workers, artists, the professions that people had at that time from the 1910s to 20s to 30s. And What's great about these portraits is that they're very everyday, they're very banal, um, and he was working at a time when we didn't just necessarily walk around and saying, oh, you're a great street photographer, but rather his images have quite a bit of intent, focus, and um, he really tried to capture those who were not famous people, who were the uh, working class. And there's something really striking about the use of light, the diffusion of light across some of these subjects' faces. They're really quite compelling. Not so different from some photos that we see today when people go out and take pictures out in the sunflower field, but perhaps <laughs> more solemn and more serious. Irving Penn is another photographer, uh, but an American photographer who is really well known for his fashion photography, his portraits, and still lifes. Uh, he lived between 1917 and died in 2009, um, but throughout his career, he worked at Vogue magazine. He did a lot of independent advertising work for clients, 
including Clinique, and his work has been exhibited internationally as it continues to inform a lot of photography today. And <laughs> this series of images taken on a 4x5 uh, or 8x10 large format camera, which you can see by the borders framing these images, are really quite compelling fashion images, which take this super narrow corridor, this narrow hallway that's not super pristine and clean, and showcase the person, the costume, the pose, the accessory, the pipe, the scarf, in uh, the, the image. And of course, I absolutely encourage you all to take a deeper dive into any of these photographers' work if um, one of them strikes you or a couple of them strike you. Richard Avedon is another photographer to bring up as he is super well known for his 1960s work in fashion photography um, and working in Harper's Bazaar and Vogue as well, uh, photographed many of the famous people uh, at the time. He lived from 1923 to 2004 and um, there was an obituary, when his obituary obituary was published in the New York Times it said his fashion and portrait photographs helped define America's image of style beauty and culture for the last half century and so here are some of his studio portraits a very very different and unique approach for the time um, you know having someone actually do something and not remain static when their portrait was being taken or this image of the uh, modern art dancer, um, modern dancer, contemporary modern dancer, Martha Graham, posing between two elephants. He he's very well known for his photographs of Marilyn Monroe, as you can see here in this um, sort of multiple exposure panorama of different poses that she did in this beautiful sparkly gown. But interestingly, after the shoot was over, um, he took this portrait of her, which is really interesting because it's not as exuberant or jovial or in certainly not what we think of when we think of Marilyn Monroe, but she didn't know he was taking the portrait and had sort of gazed off and he snapped a picture right here. And it becomes this sort of psychological inquiry into what was really going on in uh, Marilyn's mind. This is King Edward VIII, the Duke of Windsor and Wallace Simpson. And this is Andy Warhol. You can see him on the middle frame at the far right. This is Andy Warhol and the members of the factory. This photo was taken in 1969, or rather this triptych of photographs taken in 1969. Avedon photographed uh, the artist Andy Warhol and his whole entourage of aspiring actors and directors testifying to, quote, the dubious glory of the whole disreputable crew, uh, unquote. So they're in this triptych, you see full frontal nudity together with the inclusion of Candy Darling. You can see her on the far right, who um, was a transsexual who often appeared in the films that Andy Warhol made signifies this sort of daring sexuality and communicates the liberal and rebellious attitudes of the whole group. Warhol studio space was actually called the factory or dubbed the factory. So these are all the people who would be in his bigger artist community uh, who would be in and out of those doors frequently. Um, it oftentimes drew the outrageous, the talented, the unconventional through its doors, and by the late 1960s had become, quote, both site and symbol of the alternative culture's disdain for the bourgeois ethic, from work to sex to control of consciousness, a sanctified space where leisure and pleasure reigned, uh, unquote. And that was by Sally Barnes. <laughs> 
Sally Baines from uh, Greenwich Village, 1963. So another interesting photograph that Avedon took of Warhol is um, a picture he made in his studio after Andy Warhol was actually shot multiple times by Valerie Solanas, who is a feminist extremist, and she had, in her mind, decided that Warhol had too much control over her, and she was, and that um, she accused Warhol of trying to steal her work, and so she shot him with plans to kill him outside his studio, um, and then he spent a really long time recovering in the hospital. He made it through, but um, he never fully recovered. And Avedon took this portrait after he'd been all stitched up on the side. So Avedon worked with many of the talented, influential artists, dancers, actors, um, athletes of the time and photographed them in multiple circumstances, multiple situations in his studio. And of course, we talked about this uh, at the beginning, but photographed Janis Joplin as well. Um, these super iconic portraits conveying the free-spirited attitude of the Grateful Dead, of rock and roll in the 1960s. Mary Ellen Mark, we looked at her work briefly as well, but she has uh, photographed, in addition to her more photojournalistic work, photographed actors and actresses. For example, this 1994 portrait of Liam ne Neeson, where you get this quite intentional feeling um, profile image, and you can really see the sort of chiseled out um, contour of his nose, his mouth, his forehead. Um, I think it, it was a really interesting choice as far as the pose. This portrait of Angelina Jolie and many others. A portrait of Dustin Hoffman um, standing by a, uh, a fence and the shadow from that fence just falls on him and sort of makes him so much a part of, of that scene. And Mary Ellen Mark also photographed um, people who were in lower income areas in the 90s, homeless people, uh, people who she felt needed to have some kind of voice through her images. And so this picture is called Amanda and her cousin Amy, uh, taken in North Carolina in 1990. Uh, she also spent much time, you know, speaking about, speaking of um, female objectification or is it objectification or not of, of women. Um, this is an interesting comparison to the photograph I showed you by Lee Friedlander. Um, Mary Ellen Mark was also really well known for going to strip clubs where she would photograph the women who were working. And if you look closely at this photo, you can actually see the flash of her camera in um, the mirrors, but she consciously framed it so she herself doesn't really appear in the image. Annie Leibovitz is very well known as a photographer still working today uh, who's created countless images of famous people for Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and um, her images are at this point known as being super iconic. This is a portrait of Venus and Serena Will Williams from 2016. Uh, and then, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio uh, holding a white swan. Portrait of Julianne Moore and her daughter Liv, who was 12 years old at the time. This photo is from 2014, and it's like, so striking and so compelling and uncanny that their hair color is so, so similar. But you have that really super soft light falling on them. The other thing to note with Leibovitz's work is um, she's sort of the boss master of showing the, the bits and pieces of her studio in the background. So if you look carefully at this photo, you can actually see the edge of the gray backdrop and the backdrop stand behind Julian Moore um, 
So the framing choices are really interesting here. Again, in this portrait, you can see the edge of that gray backdrop. <laughs> also a very, very famous portrait. And her work is really compelling. And um, I think a lot of celebrities like working with Annie Leibovitz because she captures something that's less superficial than what you would normally expect for a traditional magazine cover editorial. There seems to be a deeper psych psychological layer to um, the work that she creates. Timothy Greenfield Sanders uh, is an American documentary filmmaker and portrait photographer who's been based out of New York City for much of his career, photographing uh, many famous individuals like Bill Murray here, of course, with the pocket full of cigars and a red pen in his really awesome outlandish uh, t-shirt or uh, button-down shirt. And in Greenfield Sanders' work, there's, you know, that level of um, super soft light, uh, a sort of staged pose, a really relaxed look on the, the part of his subjects. And so it, it sort of becomes this, like, very commercial portrait, but also, like, this isn't necessarily the expression that you would expect. because these folks have relaxed. <laughs> the other series of images that Timothy Greenfield Sanders is very well known for are his photographs of uh, working porn stars in the California area. And so for this series, he asked um, a number of different porn stars, and there's a whole book of his work doing this. He asked if he could take a large format photograph of them fully clothed, and then in a accompanying photograph, have them take their clothes off and also pose in the exact same position. And so it's this, again, this sort of like psychological idea of what is a portrait? What is the body? Do people who um, uh, are actively engaged in, you know, showing their body on the screen and for the lens for the image um, in a uh, filmmaking context, how does that come across in the portraits he takes? So somewhat controversial, of course, but his subjects all complied and were interested in being a part of this project. Lastly, uh, we're gonna look at Platon's work, who's a British portrait and documentary photographer. And in uh, his images, like this image of Prince, he tends to use a wide angle lens, which sort of makes the portrait have this dynamic movement to it. So when Prince is reaching out his hand towards the camera lens, it becomes this really intimate invitation to walk with him or to come with him. And it distorts the body in interesting ways as well. And you'll notice this if you photograph on your lens at like 18 millimeters as opposed to 55 millimeters, you're going to get more of that barrel distortion, which can have some interesting effects on the body or make the body seem not quite right. For example, in this portrait of Bill Clinton, um, <laughs> his knees and hands are the closest uh, body parts to the camera and the hands, the knees, are almost as large as his face here. And so it sort of calls to question, you know, hands are a symbol of power, um, hands are uh, a symbol of, of comfort, that you're in good hands, things are in good hands, um, are sort of the metaphors that I think of looking at these. Putin. And a, another very different portrait of Barack and Michelle Obama.
So these are some really great examples of famous portraits. And I hope you spend some more time with this lecture researching famous portraits on your own and finding one to work with for our famous portrait recreation project. Please reach out if you have any questions, but I'm so glad I got to share some of these images with you all. Thanks so much.